A is playing third. No, who's playing first? Who's on first? No, what's on second? I don't know. He's on third. There I go. Back on third again. Will you stay on third base and don't go off? All right, all right. What do you want to know? Now, who playing third base? Why do you insist on putting who on third base? What am I putting on third? No, what's on second? What, who on second? No, who is on first? Oh, no. Third base. On June 19th, 1845, each baseball game has 12,386,344 possible plays. And we'll be illustrating them all as we go forward. <laughs> uh, where's Jeanette? Okay, you ready? Life is a baseball game. I think you have words in your seats. Hi, yeah. welcome everyone. Hi. You, I want I wanted to uh, uh, make tribute to both places I used to live, which was Seattle. So I'm wearing Mariners, but I'm originally from New York, so that, that's uh, why I have a hat and a, and a uniform that's two different places. I, I had another I had another thing I'd wear San Diego. <laughs> Anyway, on your seats is a program, not a program, but a, a sheet called Life is a Ball Game. It's the story of um, the song that I'm going to do, and I thought you'd like to know a little bit uh, about it. It was uh, sung by Winona Park, and it's from the movie 42, which, you have, which if you haven't seen it, I highly recommend it. It's um, the story of Jackie Robinson. And I recently uh, watched it, and when the credits come up, she sings Life is a Ball Game. And she is a gospel singer, and she used a lot of the words that have to do with um, Christ and Jesus, and she uses them as players on the baseball field, and also things like temptation and sin. So it's very clever lyrics. She was one of the only people at the time to do such a thing where she brought in a national pastime, or what they call a secular type of subject and made it a gospel song. And I, I recommend uh, you go to YouTube and check her out um, and watch the YouTube video of Life is a Ball Game. But um, I'm going to take it and play it for you and you have the lyrics and, and you can follow along. Thank you. 
we got a couple guys up here. Mark and John, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah. Well, I'm going to New York, you know. Bucky Harris, the Yanks manager, gave me a job as the coach as long as you're on the team. Uh, look, if you're the coach, you must know all the players. Right, certainly do. Well, I never met the guys, so you'll have to tell me their names, and then I'll know who's playing on the team. I'll tell you their names, but you know, strange as it may seem, they give these ball players nowadays very peculiar names. You mean funny names? Yeah, strange names, pet names, like uh, Dizzy Bean and... Uh, His brother Daffy. Daffy Bean, okay. And then the French cousin. French. Yeah, Buffet. Oh, oh Buffet Bean, oh, okay, I see. <laughs> So tell me, what are the names of the fellows on the team? Well, let's see. We have who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. That's what I wanted to find out. I say who's on first, what's on second, I don't know who's on third. Hang on a minute. Are you the manager? Yes. You're going to be the coach, too. Yes. And you don't know the fellows' names. Well, I should. Well, then who's on first? Yes. I mean the fellows' name. Who? The guy on first. Who? The first base man. Who? Uh, the guy playing first. Who is on first? I'm asking you who's on first. That's the man's name. That's whose name? Yeah. <laughs> go, ahead. Go, ahead. go ahead and tell me. That's it. That's who? Yeah. <laughs> Look, you have a first baseman. Certainly. Uh, who's playing first? That's right. <laughs> Who gets the money? Every dollar of it. <laughs> All I'm trying to find out is the fellow's name on first base. Who? The guy that gets the money. That's it. Who gets the money on first base? He does. Every dollar. Sometimes his wife comes down to collect it. <laughs> Who's wife? Yes. Well, what's wrong with that? Look. Again, all I want to know is when you sign up for first baseman, how does he sign his name? The contract. Who? The guy. Who? How does he sign it? That's how he signs it. Who? Yes. <laughs> All I'm trying to find out is what's the guy's name on first? Well, no, no, no. What's on second? I'm not asking who's on second. Who's on first? <laughs> One place at a time. Well, don't go change the players around. I'm not changing nobody. Take it easy, buddy. All I'm asking you is the guy on first base. That's right. No, no, what's on second? I'm not asking you who's on second. Who's on first? I don't know. Oh, he's on third. We're not talking about him. Let's get back to first. <laughs> now, how did I get on third base? You mentioned his name. If I mentioned the third base's name, who did I say is playing third? No, who's playing first? What's on first? No, what's on second? I don't know. He's on third. There I go. Back on third again. Would you stay on third base and don't go off? All right, all right. What do you want to know? Now, who playing third base? Why do you insist on putting who on third base? What am I putting on third? No, what's on second? <laughs> what, who on second? No, who is on first? I don't know. Third <laughs> base. <laughs> Look, you got an outfield. Sure. The left fielder's name? Why? <laughs> I just thought you asked. Well, I thought I'd tell you. <laughs> God says, tell me who's playing left field. Who is playing first? I'm not. Stay out of the infield. I want to know what the guy's name on in left field. No, what's on second? I'm not asking who's on second. No, who's on first? I don't know. Third base. <laughs> and the left fielder's name? Why? Uh, no, he's center field. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's the fellow's name. Look. Got a pitcher. Sure. The pitcher's name. Tomorrow. <laughs> you don't want to tell me today? I am telling you today. Well, go ahead. Tomorrow. What time? What time what? At what time tomorrow are you going to tell me who's pitching? Now listen, who is not pitching? Who is on first? I'll break your arm if you say who's on first. I want to know what's the pitcher's name. What's on second? 
by the catcher? Certainly. The catcher's name. Today. <laughs> Today. And tomorrow is pitching. Now you've got it. All they got is a couple of days on the team. You know, I'm a catcher too. So they tell me. Look, I get behind the plate. Do some fancy catching. Tomorrow's pitching on my team, and a heavy hitter gets up. Yes. Now, the heavy hitter bumps the ball. When he bumps the ball, me being a good catcher, I want to throw the guy out at first base. So, I pick up the ball and throw it to who? Now, that's the first thing you've said right all day. I don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> well, that's all you have to do. <laughs> Just throw the ball at first base. Yes. Now, who's got it? Naturally. <laughs> <laughs> Look, if I throw the ball to first base, somebody's got to get it. Now, who has it? Naturally. Who? Naturally. <laughs> naturally. Naturally. So I pick up the ball and throw it to naturally. No, you throw the ball to who? Naturally. That's, that's it. <laughs> that's what I said. No, that's not what you said. I throw the ball to naturally. No, you throw it to who? Naturally. That's it. That's what I said. Listen, you, you asked me. I throw the ball to who? Naturally. Now you ask me. You throw the ball to who? Naturally. That's it. Same as you. No, you just change them around. <laughs> Whoever it is drops the ball, the guy who runs the second, who picks up the ball, throws it to what? What throws it to? I don't know, and I don't know, throws it back to tomorrow. Triple play. Yes, I suppose. Another guy gets up, and it's a long fly ball to be caused. Why? I don't know. He's on the and I don't give a damn. I said I don't give a damn. Oh, that's our shortstop. <laughs> Tinker. And Evers. And Chance. 
ruthlessly <laughs> picking our non-fallen bubble, making a giant hit into a double. Words that are heavy with nothing but trouble, finger to ever to chance. Continues with this bit of trivia. William Howard Taft, the heaviest president, was the first one to throw a, a baseball pitch at the first pitch of the baseball season, beginning a tradition that continues today. The game was in 1910 between the Washington Senators and the Philadelphia Athletics. The Senators won three to zero. It shows how long ago that was. Okay, we got Walter coming up. Yankee ends a real trouble. about a Yankee and a corker of a mystery. Jake and his troop, Jason Grinsley, a relief pitcher in his first season with the Yankees, was among those who flocked to see the movie Mission Impossible in 1996. And as he watched Tom Cruise and an accomplice crawl through an air duct to steal secret information, memories of his own impossible mission came back to him. Grinsley didn't steal government secrets, but he was at the center of a heist that is part of baseball lore for its audacity and its ingenuity. For the first time, Grimsley acknowledged just last week that it was he who crawled through the innards of Chicago's Comiskey Park into the umpire's dressing room on July 15, 1994, to replace an illegally corked bat of his <laughs> Cleveland Indians teammate, Albert Bell, with a bat that was cork free. That was one of the biggest adrenaline rushes I've ever experienced, Grimsley said. The Indians were often a playoff race with the White Sox as they played in Chicago, and Bell, the Indians' left fielder, was obliterating American League pitching. When the season was ended by a strike on August 12th, he had a 357 batting average and 36 home runs. Chicago's manager, Gene Lamont, had been tipped off that Bell might have hollowed out the barrel of his bat and filled it with cork, which makes the head of a bat lighter, increasing the speed of the swing. It is the prerogative of any manager, uh, as is the, the prerogative of any manager, Lamont challenged the legality of Bell's bat in the first inning, a process that automatically <coughs> prompted an umpire, in this case Dave Phillips, to take the bat and lock it in his dressing room for a fight for a later examination. The bat was removed from the field of Cleveland dugout was seized with concern. Bell's teammates knew it contained the illegal substance, and once that was discovered, their best hitter would be suspended. Grimsley, who was one of the Indians' starting pitchers, but wasn't working that night, said, well, as I was sitting there, the thought came to my mind, I can get that bat. Grimsley, whose role was confirmed by American League officials, said he knew that the clubhouse had a false ceiling with removable square tiles, and he surmised that the umpire's dressing room on the same level had the same kind of ceiling. Grimsley walked back towards the clubhouse and down the hallway to do some reconnaissance. He noted the whereabouts of the umpire's room and the cinder block walls that framed the rooms. If he climbed above the ceiling, Grimsley figured, he could crawl atop the cinder block walls, work his way from the Indian's clubhouse to the umpire's room. He estimated the distance between the clubhouse and the umpire's room to be at least 100 feet. A Grimsley, who was born and reared in Cleveland, Texas, is 6'3 and 180 pounds, as tall and lanky as a Sahara cactus. He'd never done this sort of thing before. He'd never been afraid of adventure. He climbed trees aggressively as a child, loved to ride his bike and his motorcycle over jumps, and when he was 12, he ran a motorcycle over a stump and lost his left big toe. <laughs> this was like a puzzle to be solved, he said. It's like the game we play. This was a challenge. Grimsley, who was the primary operator, but it was said it was a, he was aided by another member of the organization who was not a player procured a yellow flashlight and a cork-free bat, then climbed onto the desk in the office of manager Mark Mike Hargrove, removed a ceiling tile, climbed to the top of the cinder block wall. 
They really had to balance on a wall 18 inches wide and a slip he would through the ceiling. Grimsley aimed his flashlight to locate it out on a wall at which he knew he would have to turn. Some light seeped through tile cracks, but it was very dark and very hot. It's pretty hairy up there, said Grimsley, whose journey was complicated by piping that hung down from wires and crossed the cinder block wall. Grimsley and his accomplice had to move slowly and carefully over the pipes, lest they rupture them and destroy the whole operation. Grimsley figures it took them 35 to 40 minutes to traverse the distance to where they guessed the umpire's room would be. Grimsley made two turns, and as he moved closer to the umpire's room, the slant of the stands above him slowly reduced his headroom, and as he neared the destination, Grimsley had to pull himself along on his stomach with a flashlight in his mouth. At <laughs> last, he reached what he thought was the umpire's room and removed the tire. Uh-oh, he had miscalculated. There was a groundskeeper in there, sitting on a couch, he said. I put the tire back down, but he had to know. Thank goodness, he didn't say nothing. And now, knowing precisely where he was, Grimsley moved a few feet to his right and lifted the tile to the umpire's dressing room. My heart was going a thousand miles an hour, Grimsley said, and in I went. I just rolled the dice. Oh, <laughs> crapshoot. What if an umpire had walked in at that moment? <laughs> a nail. A busted. Grimsley said he quickly dropped from the top of the refrigerator to the counter and down, and immediately spotted Bell's bat in an umpire's locker. And the exchange, as imperfect as it was, According to another member of the Indians organization, Grimsley had to switch Bell's bat with one belonging to Paul Sorrento, because every one of Bell's bats was corked. <laughs> Grimsley said he climbed back up, paused to make sure that his footprints weren't apparent in the dust on top of the refrigerator, and replaced the tire. As soon as I got back up, somebody came into that room and said, I had to sit there for about like two minutes, but I was only 20 or 30 feet away from somebody. Grimsley doesn't know for sure if that person was an umpire. Whoever it was, left. Grimsley and his accomplice returned to the Cleveland clubhouse four innings after the operation began. He said he informed the rest of the Indians of his success. They couldn't believe that he had reclaimed the bat. They were pretty excited, he said. After the game, which the Indians won 3-2, to two, the umpires had no doubt that the bats had been switched. The one in their possession bore Sorrento's name. White Sox officials were apoplectic, and there was talk of bringing in the FBI. Ultimately, the Indians were told that if they returned Bell's original bat, there would be no punishment for whomever had made the switch. They complied, and Bell was given a 10-game suspension, a penalty that was appealed and reduced to seven games. And Grimsley's role was not disclosed at the time. Since the bat was returned, Bell was punished, Nearly five years have passed. It's highly unlikely that baseball officials will pursue the matter further with the now 31-year-old pitcher. Grimsley and his teammates were supportive of his action, but there was no doubt about his motivation. I had the interest of the Cleveland Indians at heart, said Grimsley, who was later treated to a round of golf by Bell. The next day, Grimsley, whose identity as the culprit was unknown to the White Sox, was standing in the outfield with a couple of teammates when Mike Lavieri, the Chicago catcher, walked over to him. Hey, I heard you guys had a Mission Impossible last night, Lavieri said, smiling. That's beautiful. And he walked away, leaving Grimsley grinning behind him. <laughs> Major League Baseball right-hand pitcher. Like most pitchers, he was famous for his inability to hit a home run, which caused his manager, Alvin Dark, to say, they'll put a man on the moon before he hits a home run. Just after Apollo 11 dropped Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin on the moon, Perry hit the first home run of his baseball career. <laughs> Right? 
Hello, everybody. How are we Spring is like on Jupiter and Mars. In other words, hold my hand. In other words, darling, kiss me. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for. All I worship and adore. In other words, please be true. In other words, I love you. Fill my heart with song and let me sing forevermore. You are all I long for. All I worship and in other words, please be true. In other words, in other words, in other words, I love you. Shoes and gloves, they're up in your bedroom. 
you'd like to be, would you like to be the greatest baseball player in all of history? Big Joe? No joke. You can be a great ball player. I can't even bend over and touch my knees. Try it, just relax. <laughs> hey, what do you know? With my help, a lot of things come easy. Hey, how'd you pull that off? <laughs> I'm handy with fire. <laughs> Who are you? I'm quite a famous character, Mr. Boy, and I have historical significance too. In fact, I'm responsible for most of the history that you can name. Listen, you know, I don't, I don't know what the, this gag is. This world is crazy, full of crazy things, crazier every day. Gosh, what are you doing here? Great events bring forth great men, Joe. They arise from nowhere. They take command. That's history. What are you talking about? I have chosen you, the most dedicated partisan of the noble Washington Senators, to be the hero who leads them out of the wilderness to the championship. Uh, the Senators are in seventh place. Your powerful <laughs> bludgeon and sparkling play will inspire the team to greatness. We'll call you Hardy, Joe Hardy. You'll be 23 years old. They'll put a new wing on that baseball museum at Cooperstown, dedicated to you, the Hardy Shrine. <laughs> What do you want me to do? Just leave everything to me. My job? My wife? This is a big operation. Can't be bothered and let things like that stand in the way. Well, I just disappear. Is that it? Very simple. And uh, what happens after I stop being a baseball player? Then uh, where would I be? <laughs> well, of course, that's fairly well known, isn't it? <laughs> Yes, but I mean, after all, there's nothing unusual about it. How do you suppose some of these politicians around got started? Or some of these parking lot owners. So, I mean, what they <laughs> look, look, look. I've got something to trade. I'm offering you a chance that you've wanted all your life. In my business, we have what you call an escape clause. Uh, this is not a real estate deal. Look, if I don't like it, I ought to be able to get out. Get out. I've got my wife to consider. All right, all right. I don't want to hear any more about wives. Wives, they cause me more trouble than the Methodist Church. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to be understanding, but all this haggling. All right, I'll give you a chance to get out. Oh, sure. In that case... On the 24th of September at midnight. I wouldn't do it, but I don't want to have them damn Yankees win. Ha! You can say that again. All right, it's a deal. It is? Now the other hand. That's all? Sure. What do you expect? Your name in blood or some phony stuff like that? Come on, the team's what? Wait, uh, need you. There's no time to waste. Okay, there's one thing to know for my wife, and uh, get my shoes and my glove. Okay, okay. Tell her you're going to Little America to interest Eskimos and split level homes. Hey, I'm nearly ready. I'll call a taxi. Let's go, Joe. More than 150 years ago, in 1858, the first known baseball song was written. It was called the Baseball Polka. Not quite as famous as Jack Norworth's 1908 classic, Take Me Out to the Ball Game, which was written on some scrap paper on a train ride to Manhattan. Norworth then provided those paper scrap lyrics to Albert von Tilzer, who composed the music, which in turn was published by the York Music Company. And before the year 1908 was over, a hit song was born. Jack Norworth was a very successful vaudeville entertainer and songwriter. He spent 15 minutes writing this classic, which is sung during the seventh inning stretch and nearly every ballpark in the country. So, ladies and gentlemen, let's stand up and sing! Grand Slam Italiano would be a fun, creative way to bring this lovely exhibit, 
artist tribute to Italian American and baseball to life through music and literature. We would like to thank each and every one of you for joining us this evening and to support the Convivio Society's mission. Grand Slam Italiano fulfills a vital component of, of Convivio Society's mission, which is uh, the creation and advancement of innovative <coughs> cultural arts programming. We would like to thank you, our cast of talented artists for donating their time and creativity to this performance showcase. And we would like to give a big cheer to our sound man, Dan, who always makes <laughs>
from a heart attack. Now we're going to ask John to come up here and help us out with Eugene's Baseball Dream. I'm sure most of you are, uh, I suppose, fans of Neil Simon. Neil Simon. Uh, he wrote a, a piece called Brighton Beach Memoir, in which there's a young man named Eugene, who's a bit of a case. He reminds me of me when I was a young man, like back in the 30s. And this kid's in the 30s, and he's wearing knickers, so you know he's in the 30s. We used to always buckle them below the knee, of course. We didn't move around. Anyway, I'm going to give you all the characters. I'm going to do the aunt and the aunt, and I'm going to do the mother and the snivelly little uh, uh, cousin. And that's going to be it. But it's an interesting piece, though, because uh, it, it's the way many boys look at baseball, this boy in particular. The cast is Eugene Jerome, the young man, Kate Jerome, his mother, who's always on his face, Aunt Blanche, who's Kate's younger sister and is suffering from a horrendous headache this particular day. And there's Laurie, her cousin, who's a bit of a pain in the neck. She's studying for a history final and doesn't want any noise in the house. Okay, so with your kind of indulgence, I'll act all four characters. I'll change my voice. I don't do that. Okay, <clears throat> to set the scene, outside of the grass is Eugene Jerome, almost but not 15, a boy obsessed with two things the thief, the skeet, sorry, the female anatomy and his love of baseball. He's wearing knickers, a shirt and tie, a faded torn sweater, Ked sneakers, and a blue baseball cap. He has a beaten, worn baseball glove on his left hand, and in his right hand he holds a ball that's so old and battered it's ready to fall apart. In his fantasy ball game, which he plays quite frequently, he plays many roles. Player, broadcast announcer, and fan in the stand. <coughs> Standing on, a mat on an imaginary pitcher's mound, he looks back over his shoulder to an imaginary runner on second, then back over to the batter. Then winding up, he pitches, his ball hitting loudly a garden wall. And then, one out, a man on second, followed with the seventh inning, two balls and no strikes. Ruffing checks a runner on second, gets a sign from Bill Dickey. Ruffing stretches, ruffing pitches, caught in the outside corner, steal right one, and a baby, no hitter up there. One out, man on second, bottom of the seventh, two balls, one strike. Ruffing checks the runner again on second, gets a sign from Dickey, Ruffing stretches, he pitches, low and outside, ball three. Come on, Red, make him a hitter. No batter up there. In there all the time, Red. Aunt Blanche, Kate, please, my head is splitting. <coughs> Kate, Mama Kate, I told that boy a million times, Eugene, stop banging that wall. He loves her son. One out, man on second, bottom of the seventh, three balls, one strike, roughing stretches, roughing pitches. Oh no, how and how high and outside, Jojo Moore walk. First and second, and Melot lopes up to the plate. <laughs> Blanche, can he do it someplace else? I'll break his arm, that's where I'll do it. Eugene, I'm not going to tell you again, do you hear me? It's the last batter, Mom. Melod is up. It's a crucial moment in World Series history. <laughs> Kate, your odd Blanche has a splitting headache. Blanche, look, I don't want him to stop playing. It's just banging. Laurie, little cousin. He's only does that when I'm studying. I have a big test of history tomorrow. One pitch, Mom. I think I can get him to pop up. I have my stuff today. Your father will give you plenty of stuff when he gets home. You hear? All right, all right. I want you inside, Eugene. Put out the water glasses. Blanche. I can do that. Why? Is his arm broken? And I don't want any back talk from you, mister. Eugene cups his hand and looks up, looks at us at the, at the imaginary grandstand. Attention, ladies and gentlemen. Today's game will be delayed because of my aunt watches today. <laughs> <laughs> when you have 
three daughters, the things don't stop. <laughs> We're actually pulling one of the paintings out. I'm going to sing to it. All right. You want me to talk about them? Yes. Well, this young man was a St. Augustine High School student. I, I taught him in a couple of classes. Uh, I first met him when he was 12 years old when I was working at the time, which was the best game park. Uh, he ended up being a professional ball player for the Giants, for the San Diego Padres, named Johnny DeQuisto. He's had some problems in life, but he's a fine young man. He comes to keep him a fine young family. And uh, all three of my girls had a crush on this dude. <laughs> so, uh, we went to his wedding. He was married right over here, Lady of the Rosemary. They had their reception at the El Cortez. And my girls came in their dreamy eyes. Oh, God. Yeah. yeah. My girls were, they were psyched that I taught them an all boys school. And none of the boys would date my girls. They were obvious people. <laughs> That's right, they would not. Anyway, Johnny DeQuisto has been a close friend ever since. He lives in Phoenix, Arizona now, and I hear from him frequently. But anyway, this one really had a crush on. That's all I'm going to say. <laughs> pleasure of attending John Aquisto's wedding. I think it was his first wedding. So picture this. <laughs> picture this. The Bowen family dressed in our Sunday best, riding to the tippy top of the El Cortez Hotel in a glass elevator. Do you remember that, I think? It was really cool. I remember waiting with the rest of the guests in the ballroom for John and his wife to make their grand entrance. And as they came through the doors, I recall staring at him and thinking, you are the dreamiest man I've ever seen in my life. And then I remember looking at her and thinking, I wish you'd just disappear. <laughs> so I'd like to dedicate this song to the handsome Italian baseball player who stole my heart so many years ago, John D'Aquisto. <laughs> Baseball is a 19th century pastoral game. 
Football is a 20th century technological struggle. Baseball <laughs> is played on a diamond in a park. The baseball park. Football is played on the gridiron in a stadium sometimes called Soldier Field or War Memorial Stadium. <laughs> Baseball begins in the spring, the season of new life. Football begins in the fall when everything is dying. <laughs> in football, you wear a helmet. In baseball, you wear a cap. <laughs> football is concerned with downs. Which down is it? Baseball is concerned with ups. Who's up? You up? I'm not up. He is up. In football, the specialist comes in to kick. In baseball, the specialist comes in to relieve somebody. In football, you receive a penalty. In baseball, you make an error. <gasps> Whoops. <laughs> football has hitting, clipping, spearing, blocking, piling on, late hitting, unnecessary roughness, and personal foul. Baseball. Sacrifice. <laughs> Football is played in any kind of weather. Rain, sleet, snow, hail, mud. Can't read the numbers on the field. Can't read the yard markers. Can't read the players' numbers. The struggle will continue. <laughs> in baseball, if it rains, we don't come up to play. I can't come up to play. It's raining. <laughs> baseball has a seventh inning. Football has the two-minute warning. <laughs> Baseball has no time limit. We don't know when it's going to end. We might have extra innings. Football is rigidly timed and it will end even if we have to go to sudden death. <laughs> In baseball, during the game in the stands, there's a kind of a picnic feeling. <laughs> Emotions may run high or low, but there's not that much unpleasantness. In football in the stands, during the game, you can be sure that at least 23 times you are perfectly capable of taking the life of a fellow human being, <laughs> preferably a stranger. <laughs> and finally, the objective of the two games are totally different. In football, the object is for the quarterback, otherwise known as the field general, to be on target with his aerial assault, riddling the defense by hitting his receivers with deadly accuracy, in spite of the blitz, and even if he has to use the shotgun. <laughs> With short bullet passes and long bombs, he marches his troops into enemy territory, balancing his aerial assault with a sustained ground attack while punching holes in the forward walls of his enemy's defensive line. In baseball, the object is to go home and, and to be safe. I hope I'll be safe at home. Their blow 
by blow. Our kids will tell their kids his name. Jolt and Joe DiMaggio. Joe, Joe DiMaggio, we want you on our side. And now they speak in whispers low of how they stopped our Joe. One night in Cleveland, oh, oh, oh. Goodbye, street DiMaggio. <laughs> We've got a classic ahead, and I'm telling you the story of Casey at the Bat. That started in 1885, when George Hearst decided to run for state senator in California. To self-promote his brand of politics, Hearst purchased the San Francisco Examiner. At the completion of the election, Hearst gave the newspaper to his son, William Randolph. William, who had experience editing the Harvard Lampoon while at Harvard College, took to California three Lampoon staffers. One of those was Ernest L. Thayer, who signed his humorous Lampoon articles with the pen name Finn. In the June 3, 1888 issue of The Examiner, Finn appeared as the author of the poem we all know as Casey at the Back. The poem received very little attention. And a few weeks later, it was partially republished in the New York Sun, though the author was now known as Anon. <laughs> did the same, a pall-like silence fell upon the patrons of the game. A straggling few got up to go in deep despair. The rest clung to that hope which springs eternal in the human breast. They thought if only Casey could but get a whack at that. We put up even money now with Casey at the bat. But Flynn preceded Casey, as did also Jimmy Blake. The former was a hoodoo, while the latter was a cake. So, upon that stricken multitude, grim melancholy sat. There seemed but little chance of Casey getting to the bat. But Flynn let drive a single to the wonderment of all, and Blake, the much despised, and tore the cover off the ball. And when the dust had settled, the men saw what had occurred. There was Jimmy safe at second, and Flynn a hug and third. Then from five thousand throats and more, there rose a lusty yell. It rumbled through the valley, it rattled through the dell. It pounded on the mountain and recoiled upon the flat. For Casey, mighty Casey, was advancing to the bat. There was ease in Casey's manner as he stepped into his place. There was pride in Casey's bearing and his smile at Casey's face. And when responding to the cheers, he lightly doffed his hat. No stranger in the crowd could doubt Twas Casey. Ten thousand eyes were on him as he rubbed his hands with dirt. Five thousand tongues applauded when he wiped them on his shirt. Then, while the writhing pitcher ground the ball into his hip, defiance flashed in Casey's eye. A snarl, a sneer curled in Casey's lip. Now the leather-covered sphere came hurtling through the air, and Casey stood watching it in haughty grandeur there. Close by the sturdy batsman, the ball unheeded sped. That ain't my style, said Casey. Steering one, the umpire said. From the benches, black with people, there went, a, there went up a muffled roar, like the beating of the storm waves on a stern and distant shore. Kill him! Kill the umpire! shouted someone on the stand, and it's likely they'd have killed him had not Casey raised his hand. With a smile of Christian charity, great Casey's visage showed. He stilled the rising tumult and bade the game go on. 
He signaled to the pitcher, and once more the dun sphere flew. But Casey still ignored it, and the umpire said, Straight to! Fraud! cried the maddened thousands, and Echo answered, Fraud! But one scornful look from Casey, and the audience was awed. They saw his face grow stern and cold. They saw his muscles strain. And they knew that Casey wouldn't let that ball go by again. The sneer has fled from Casey's lip. His teeth are clenched in hate. He pounds with cruel violence his bat upon the plate. And now the pitcher holds the ball, and now he lets it go. And now the air is shattered by the force of Casey's blow. Oh. Somewhere in this favored land, the sun is shining bright. The band is playing somewhere, and somewhere hearts are light. <laughs> and somewhere men are laughing and little children shout. But there is no joy in Mudville. Great Casey has struck out. <laughs>